Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, where we're going to be looking at how to design a guest wireless LAN. This will be a theoretical presentation because we're not looking at a specific vendor solution. We're not looking at step-by-step -step instructions for one given vendor, but rather we're going to be talking about the different ways in which we need to think about the design of a guest wireless LAN. Now this webinar, for those of you preparing for CWDP, the Certified Wireless Design Professional, does indeed relate to that certification because there are objectives in that certification where you'll need to understand the design concepts related to guest wireless lands and how we build those and so forth. So you'll be learning those important concepts here today. This webinar is scheduled to go about 30 minutes. And so we do like to keep most of our webinars down in the 30 to 45 minute time frame, so you can get a nice nugget of information in a shorter amount of time. My name, for those of you who do not know me, is Tom Carpenter, and I'm the CTO here at CWNP. And uh, we are in the process right now of building up to the launch of the new CWDP exam, which will come out in September. And uh, with that, there will be study guides and e-learning and practice exams and all of the rest of the materials we always provide to help people prepare for those certifications. Now, before we get into the details of the presentation today, I do want to remind you, if you're new with us here at CWNP, that we provide several different certifications related to wireless networking or 802.11 wireless LANs. It all starts with the CWNA, the Certified Wireless Network Administrator, and then building on that flagship certification are professional level specialties in security, design, and analysis. So you can move just one level up to specialization in one of those three areas, or if you desire to become a certified wireless network expert, you can pass all three professional level exams and then apply to become a CWNE. It is an application-based process, and the individual who becomes a CWNE is one who would have passed those three exams and had three years of, CERD, of experience working in the wireless LAN industry under their belt. So before we move any further, and just to make sure that everybody can hear me because someone did just ask if we're about to start, um, is are you able to hear me? If so, if in the chat, if you just wanna say yes, that'll let me know that you can hear me and I'll know that we're uh, good to move forward with that. Okay, excellent, very good. Now, the the other factor then that I want to point out to you is if you have questions uh, during the presentation today, do feel free to send those in. You can send them to all participants and uh, that way everybody will receive the questions and just do it in the chat. Don't worry about the Q&A window, just use the chat window. So if you have any questions at all uh, that you want to ask about what I'm talking about at the time or maybe even something I haven't covered, feel free to type those in and again send them to all participants so that everyone can see your questions and we'll get those answered as we can as we go along. So with that said about CWNP and who we are, let's talk a little bit about the agenda today. Very basic agenda of what we're going to cover. We'll be talking about why we implement guest wireless LANs in the first place. So what's the point of having a guest wireless LAN as opposed to just letting everyone onto our network? And then we'll talk about the different implementation models that are there. We'll talk about security considerations when implementing a guest wireless LAN, and then some of the different solutions, looking at them in detail. So what are some of the implementation model solutions that we need to uncover in detail in order to understand the importance of implementing a well-designed and secure guest wireless LAN? So first of all, why have a guest wireless LAN in the first place? Why not just give access to our network for every person that wants access to our network and just let them onto our own network as opposed to the guest network? Well, the answer is that a guest wireless LAN gives you extra security because in some way it is segregated from the rest of the network. And we'll talk more about that later on. But the reason for providing that segregated network is because internet access is just expected by many today. 
Even a sales professional who comes to your facility may expect that you can provide internet access to them. And that's really what they're after. They're after internet access. Sometimes they might want a local printer, but more often than not, they just want to check their email or send an email or download a file to communicate with you and so forth. So sales professionals, contractors, uh, employee family members who come in to visit on special days and so on, uh, interns. These are just a few examples of people who come into your network or your facility and expect to be able to have access to your network. And so having a guest wireless LAN helps you to provide them with what they want while also protecting your organizational data. So you're keeping them separate from your network. And because of that, you have better protection. Now, the good news is that guest wireless LAN features are often available even in small office, home office equipment today. So you can get very uh, low cost hardware that does support guest wireless LANs these days. For example, uh, Cisco has small business access points that have guest wireless LAN capabilities built into them. You can even get consumer grade devices today that have guest wireless LAN capabilities built in. So it's not at all unusual to have that capability built into the different devices that are, again, in those lower grade markets, consumer grade and even uh, small office, home office grade devices that will have these capabilities in them. And the way they generally work is they implement a separate SSID that you can also define a VLAN for. And therefore, on the wired side of the network, you can control what portions of the network those guest users have access to. But we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. The main point of this slide is to remember that we want to provide a guest wireless LAN if we do, because we need to provide that internet access usually, possibly access to printers and some other resources, and we want to do it in a way that protects our organizational data, keeping people away from our information. So now that we've talked about why we might want to have a guest wireless LAN, let's talk about the implementation models that are available to us. And we have at least uh, two primary models that we could think about, and those are integrated and segregated. So this is really high level, okay? This is talking about whether or not you're going to provide access to your internal network or you're going to provide access only to the internet or some other separate location. The point then is that if it's integrated, it means you're allowing it access, the guest user's access to your network, which can be a devastating thing and not something that you want to do in most cases. So the key then is we probably want segregated guest networks. And this does not necessarily mean it's different hardware, okay? It could be that it's in the same hardware, but it's segregated using some technology. And we'll talk about those technologies as we go along. The point then of a segregated guest network is that the network is available to users, but it is not connected to the same resources that internal employees would be connected with. The segregated guest network then is going to enhance security because of this separation. And it will simplify management as well because quite often you don't want the guest users to have the same level of access in a couple of areas, both in resource access and in quality of service. And so it's quite often the case that you give a lesser priority to guest users of the network than you do employees of the network. And the reason for that is that the guest users are probably not doing mission critical tasks for your organization like the employees may be using. So therefore, it's important to uh, keep in mind that there may be simplified management on the guest network. Quite often you can set it up, get it running, and then you can forget about it quite often for long periods of time, except for the fact of having to do firmware upgrades or other type of upgrades like that that you might have to do on occasion. And so generally speaking, we implement it and just let it run and do its work with only some monitoring capabilities in place. Whereas with our full scale wireless LAN for our enterprise employees, uh, we're going to be more heavily involved in the management of that on a day-to-day -day basis. Now the guest network can be segregated in several different ways, but they fall into two categories, either virtual or physical segregation. So virtual segregation means that we're using things like VLANs and physical segregation means that we actually have physically separate access points for the guest network. So virtual VLANs and tunneling, this kind of thing, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, physical, we're actually implementing separate hardware in order to implement our 
uh, guest network. So now let's talk about the security considerations we have to think about in relation to this then. And so what we're dealing with then is two issues related to our data, of course, data access and data storage. So with data access, what we're dealing with is who can access what information. With data storage, it's who can store information on the network. Now, both of these are a security concern in relation to our guest access. So if our guest net access is not set up appropriately, then the guests may be able to access data that they shouldn't have access to. And that obviously can pose a huge security threat. But in addition, they may be able to store data they shouldn't store. For example, if you have a web server on your network and they have found some way through the guest wireless LAN to gain access to the web server, then they can put data on that web server that could then be downloaded by people across the world because it's on the internet. And so this would be a method of data distribution. Um, it's sometimes called courier access within the pirate scene. The point is that they're wanting to put data on your servers so that other people can gain access to your data, which can then reflect poorly on you with government agencies and so forth that frown upon this type of data piracy. Uh, so therefore, data storage is just as much a concern to us as data access. We don't want to become a host for uh, viruses, malware, or pirated software and things like this that might be stored on our network. The other consideration is throughput consumption. So if someone gains access to your network as a guest, then they may just be using that in order to download pirated movies and other things that they may want to download from the internet and they can consume significant amounts of your available throughput, particularly your internet connections throughput. And so it might be worth considering the throttling of that throughput. And this is a factor that you can control by having secure access to the guest network in part, but even then someone may give out a credential depending on how you're doing it. You know, think about a hotel, for example, that you might have been to where all they do is write the code on your room key uh, card in order to let you know how to access the guest Wi-Fi that's free there. Well, you could give that out to someone else and then they could access the network. And obviously then you're running into a situation where uh, someone that gains access just to consume that internet bandwidth can hurt the performance. And obviously this is where you can have a throughput throttling, bandwidth limitations, throughput limitations, whatever you want to call it, in order to control the access that someone actually has. Uh, and then of course there are network attacks and this is where they simply connect to the guest network in order to perform attacks against your uh, wired or wireless network. So they're trying to gain access to the rest of your network and they're using the guest network in order to gain that access. So these are all the considerations that we have to think about when we implement a guest network. So we know that data access, data storage, throughput consumption, and then using it as a launching point for network attacks are all concerns. So the next thing we need to ask is what are the solutions then that help us with these issues? And the solutions really are all about segregation and authentication. So the first three here are about segregation and then the last one is about authentication. So uh, segregation can be done through VLANs. Uh, these are virtual local area networks and they have been implemented for uh, a long, long time on the wired side and they're also useful on the wireless side. We can do it with separate hardware, as I've mentioned and we can do it with tunnels. And in this case, what we have is we actually have uh, tunnels going to a separate area of the physical network, and we'll see that more later. And then of course, there are registration systems in order to ensure that we have the uh, registration that we need, the authentication that we need for the users of the network. So let's talk about each of these in a little more detail. So first of all, VLANs. Whenever you set up a wireless LAN with most enterprise wireless LAN hardware and software today, you set up something called a wireless LAN profile or something that means the same thing, but they use a different term. So the wireless LAN profile is going to contain basic things like your service set identifier, your SSID. Uh, it may have a name for the profile. Then a VLAN ID is usually associated with it as well. You'll also have quality of service settings and authentication settings and things like that too. But for our purposes of a guest network here, uh, one way of setting up a guest network, even if you don't have a supposed guest network feature in your hardware or software, is to simply implement a wireless LAN profile that points to a different VLAN. And so the VLAN is the point of separation. Now it is important to know when we think about VLANs um, on the wired side, uh, 
a VLAN can really control some physical aspects of the broadcast domain, meaning that we use VLANs to shrink the broadcast domain, right? So imagine you have a switch with 48 ports and 24 of the ports are on VLAN 1 and 24 of the ports are on VLAN 2, just for simplification. Well, then it means that if there's a broadcast that a VLAN 1 device sends, it's only gonna go out to 23 other ports on that switch. And if there's a broadcast that a VLAN 2 device sends, then it's only going to go out to 23 other ports on that switch. So the broadcast domain in total is 24 uh, switch ports each. It's a very physical separation, right? Well, on an AP, you may have two or three SSIDs running off of a single access point radio. The important thing to know is there's only one channel, right, that it's on. And so with the one channel that that radio is on, it is one broadcast domain, even though there might be multiple SSIDs. There's no real way to stop that from happening because of the very medium itself, right? And so the medium itself dictates that even though I'm using multiple VLANs across the wireless medium, in effect, I still have one big broadcast domain because all of the client stations hear a frame, whether it's destined for their SSID or some other SSID, they still hear the frame and they still have to be silent and contention still has to process as it normally would on the wireless LAN. So it is important on the wireless side to keep in mind that VLANs do not on the wireless side actually give me separate broadcast domains at the physical level but they do give them to me at the higher layers. You might say the Mac layer. So in other words, the devices to which it's not targeted will ignore the frame as far as processing it, even though they can't ignore the fact that there's activity on the medium and they cannot communicate at that point in time. Okay, so VLANs then uh, give us this separation on the wired side, very physical separation. And also, once you have a VLAN, as you probably know, and I'll not belabor the point, you have the ability to set up different quality of service for the different VLANs. You have the ability to set up access control lists on the wired side for the different VLANs. And therefore, you can do things like even role-based access control and have good separation on the wired side of the network, controlling what the individuals can access. Hence, guest wireless LANs are usually mapped to a VLAN and then that VLAN is responsible for controlling what they have access to on the actual wired side of the network. Now the other way we mentioned of doing this segregation is with actual separate hardware. And in this case, you really have two models that you can think about, uh, separate radios and separate APs completely. So with separate radios, what you mean is you have two different radios in a single AP or more, and uh, these radios are used in different ways. So one might be, we're going to abandon all guests to 2.4 gigahertz. I don't know if you've heard that before, but it's, it's a thinking that says, well, you know, 2.4 gigahertz doesn't perform very well because of all of the, um, the co-channel contention that's going on there. And so because of that, there's so much activity that it's hard to get good performance in 2.4 gigahertz these days, right? Well, uh, so what we do is we abandon our guests there. We say we don't care about their performance anyway, so guests are only going to operate in 2.4 gigahertz. Well, the only problem with that is if someone does have a five gigahertz only client, they wouldn't be able to work there. Although in fairness, that's pretty rare that you have uh, someone come in with a phone or a laptop or something that is five gigahertz only. More often than not, they are dual band clients that support 2.4 and five gigahertz, or they are just 2.4 gigahertz. So yes, that is one way of thinking, but the other way and probably more common is that we have dual radios in each AP for each band. So what we have is we have a 2.4 gigahertz and a five gigahertz radio in the AP, and we run virtual SSIDs, if you will, on each of these bands in many cases. So uh, separate radios means that we have two different radios for it, but what we could also do is say, we're really kind of combining these separate radios and separate APs. So what we've got is an AP with two radios in it for guest and an AP with two radios in it for enterprise users. And so we have two APs at each location. The problem with separate APs though is 2.4 and 5 gigahertz is provided, but 2.4 gigahertz becomes a challenge because we have too few channels. So if you can imagine you've got two APs 
within very close proximity to each other, then you've got, say, channel 1 and 11 or 1 and 6 or 6 and 11 already taken up, right? And so two of your 2.4 gigahertz channels are gone just like that. And then as soon as you move to one more space nearby, you only have one channel left. And so your whole guest network uh, access kind of breaks at that point in time. Uh, you could try to get by with some kind of a structure where you say, well, we're going to use really large channel one in one area for guest, and then a really large six and a really large 11. And then we're going to carefully stagger uh, the other non-overlapping channels uh, for our enterprise users. But again, it gets very challenging to try to design a network like that. So what may work better is possibly having dedicated five gigahertz radios for guest versus enterprise, but then using virtual SSIDs in 2.4 gigahertz so that you have that better balance. So these are some things you just have to think through when you're designing a wireless LAN for guest access, particularly if you're wanting to work with separate hardware. And it's one of the reasons why separate hardware is not usually the way we do it today. But it's easier to do it by implementing virtual SSIDs. In other words, SSIDs mapped to VLANs that are sharing the same radio. Yes, that does reduce some of our throughput because we have extra overhead now, right? Because we have to have beacon frames sent out for each one of those virtual SSIDs. So there's extra overhead there. And then when one SSID is using the uh, frequency space, obviously the other SSID cannot. And so you have some sharing that goes on within the channel space, but that often is still a better design model than trying to use separate hardware to accomplish this. Now, the last of the models that we want to talk about here is the tunneling. So with tunneling, what we're looking at is taking the guest network and sending them through a tunnel to a remote wireless LAN controller. And this is normally the way it's done. So you'll have a wireless LAN controller in the demilitarized zone that connects to the internet and all guest users go straight over to that DMZ into a wireless LAN controller that's in the DMZ and they therefore access the internet from within the DMZ. They actually have no loop back, no connection back into the enterprise network. So they're completely separated from the enterprise network both by the fact that they're probably on a separate VLAN, but we're also tunneling all of their traffic, usually through a GRE tunnel or something like that, back to the wireless LAN controller in the DMZ. Now, it may not be a wireless LAN controller in the DMZ. It may be some other kind of tunnel endpoint. Uh, any kind of VPN server could act as that tunnel endpoint. But generally speaking, because the wireless LAN controller is supported these days, it's a sensible way for us to implement this kind of a guest network. And the benefit then again is you're pushing all guest users directly into the DMZ and they really just don't have the ability to access anything locally because all of their frames are forwarded through the tunnel into the DMZ controller before they're processed and allowed to have any kind of access at all. Once they're in the DMZ controller, the only access that is left for them is access to the internet. And so we get that extra security in that mode. So the two basic ways we use most often then are going to be VLANs, which means virtual SSIDs mapped to VLANs, and then tunnels. These are the two more common that we use. Uh, separate hardware is far less common simply because of the lack of 2.4 gigahertz channels that are available to us to be able to implement separate hardware for our guest networks. Now remember with all of this, you can also control how much uh, of the uh, network time the guest users are going to get versus the other users. So for example, even if a guest user is trying to make a voice over IP call from their phone or something like that, maybe a software phone on a laptop, we can still control and not give them the quality of service that they might really even need for that because they're after all a guest user and they're not one of our enterprise clients. Now the final of the four items we said we needed to consider then when it comes to implementing guest wireless LANs is our registration systems. And this is the last topic we'll talk about before we leave it for Q&A today. When it comes to registration systems, what we're talking about is the authentication side of the guest network, right? So there are several different ways that we can implement registration systems. Uh, you've probably heard of things called walled gardens, captive portals, these kinds of concepts are a, a way to get a user into an area where they don't really have any access yet, but they have to do something to gain access. Now, a registration system can support pre-registration. So this is where that 
the administrator or some other sponsor may set up a, an access for someone before they even get there. It can be a group that's given access or an individual user that's given access. And in that case, uh, ahead of time, we get the access ready for them and maybe they receive an email with their credentials. So before they ever come to the location, they already know what they're going to need to be able to sign on. And then we may be able to provide some type of a kiosk that they can use to self-register. So there might be self-registration as well, where they go in and put in some information to authenticate to the system. And sometimes all it is is they provide an email address and uh, uh, then they're given a password that's temporary and works for one hour, four hours, eight hours, what have you. And automatically the account is simply deleted after whatever that time window is that we have configured for their access. And when we have user authentication required, then again, they can log on with their email. We may use uh, social network integration. So social login is not uncommon. And they could log on with Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Yahoo, other types of services. And of course, there are always privacy issues associated with that. So some people don't like that. And that's why sometimes we'll provide the option for them to log on with their social network, which by the way, can be really helpful for retail agencies, coffee shops, these types of places that provide Wi-Fi. Because if you log on with your Facebook account or with your Twitter account or something like that, then part of that logon can be that you're approving the, uh, the receipt of tweets or messages from this Wi-Fi provider in exchange for gaining access to Wi-Fi. And so the benefit to the provider is they can now market to you, you know, let you know what the coffee of the day is or something like that. Uh, these are all very, very important. So uh, this is uh, user authentication. And again, there, there are two benefits to it. One, you're making sure that they're registered before they get on. So it gives you better security as to who's accessing even your guest network, much less, uh, of course, segregating and keeping them from the rest of your network. But then the other benefit is if you're a retail outlet of some sort and you're providing Wi-Fi like a coffee shop or a restaurant or a bookstore or anything like that, then you get the benefit of possibly being able to market to them after the fact as well. So these can give some benefits to the, uh, the support of the authentication and registration system that you might implement. So this gives you an overview then of the things you have to consider when designing guest access. And today we've not gone into any specifics about a, a, a given vendor. So you're going to see all kinds of terms related to specific vendors. Here's my suggestion to you. It's twofold. Number one, if you're preparing for the CWDP exam, do not worry about a lot of vendor specific terms because we do not test on vendor specifics. Um, but second, if you're looking at vendor specific terminology, always the best place to get information about how that works is the vendor's website themselves. So you could do a research, for example, on a term that you've read in vendor white papers or something like that in order to find out exactly what it is that uh, uh, that feature might implement. Because here's the thing, you'll see a vendor use a term that you've never heard before. And you might think that they have introduced some feature that has never existed before. But the reality is that's just the term they're giving to what everybody else calls something like band steering, for example. And so it's not uncommon to see a vendor give a term to something that is already well known in the industry, but they're simply giving that term for differentiation purposes. Sometimes they do have slightly different features and capabilities in the way they implement it, but 99% of that thing is exactly what it is by all of the other vendors. They're just using a new name. So uh, don't be blown away by that kind of thing. Watch for the terminology in the objectives. So when you look at the CWDP objectives, the terms that are there are the terms you need to know. And and you'll be tested on that terminology, making sure you understand how they function and how they work from a design perspective. And before I open it up to Q&A, one last note about CWDP preparation. Remember, CWDP is all about design. So it's about designing a wireless network. So think about every question from the perspective of design, but more important, as you're preparing, think about your preparation from the perspective of design. It's not always how does it work, but it is more important what capabilities does it provide? Because that's really what design is about. It's about making sure you have a network that provides the capabilities that you need. 
And so it's important to understand the capabilities provided by a feature. And it's less important for CWDP to know all the little nitty gritty details about the steps of how something might work, okay? So very important to keep that in mind. What capabilities does something provide me so you can choose the right solution to match the capabilities demanded by the scenario, the design scenario that you find yourself in. And with that, uh, let me open it up to questions. Again, if you want to ask any questions, just use the chat box and make sure you send your question to all participants so we can see it and uh, send in those questions in the chat box. And as you're considering questions you might have, let me just say that our conference is coming up very quick now. It's coming up September 21st through the 23rd. So we're just about a month and a half out. So it's coming up very, very quickly. Right before the conference, there will be uh, training classes held by 802 Technology Solution in CWDP and CWSP. Those are available uh, to you. There will also be testing on site. So it's very important to keep in mind that uh, you'll be able to take exams right there during the conference. If you want to learn more about that, contact Robert Bartz by emailing him at robert at 802 Dot com. That's E-I-G-H-T-O-T-W-O dot com. And uh, he can get you more information on that. And to find out more information about the conference and sign up for that, go to cwnp.com slash 2015 National Conference. cwnp.com slash 2015 National Conference. It's being held in San Francisco this year. We're going to have uh, 25 different speakers from industry. Uh, we've got a keynote speaker who used to be the head of the FCC. So there's some big things uh, coming at the conference this year. You want to make sure that you're able to participate in that. So at this time, any questions you might have, I'll give you just a minute or two to type them in and we'll answer those. But this ends the scheduled content for this webinar. So if you don't have any questions, let me say thank you very much for coming. And you can uh, feel free to disconnect at this time, but uh, I'll hang around to answer some questions here. Okay. Do you know if captive portals are legally required or can they be avoided for a better user end experience? Well, that's a great question, Glenn. And, and, and the answer, obviously, first of all, is check with your local regulatory requirements. Find out legal issues in your area. Um, but generally speaking, you're better off with having an acceptable use policy simply because you have that protection if you need it. So for example, if you have an acceptable use policy that says you're not allowed to use this network for any illegal activity, you know, something as simple as that, obviously you'd want your lawyers to word it just perfectly. But when you have that, then if someone comes and says, you know, your network was used to attack us, you can say, well, I told them not to. They agreed that they would not, and we don't monitor their activity. We simply tell them they're not allowed to do that kind of activity. And so that gives you a level of protection. And uh, there have been some court cases that have established that that does indeed provide you with a level of protection here in the United States. Again, I would check throughout the rest of uh, your regulatory domain, depending on where you are as well. Um, what is my recommendation as far as segregation, VLAN versus tunneling? Well, here's the thing, okay? Um, uh, the tunneling is going to uh, give you a little more overhead on the wired side. So you do have to keep that in mind. And what I mean by that is every one of the APs is going to be creating this tunnel back to the controller or the GRE endpoint in the uh, DMZ. So because it's now uh, a tunnel, there there are extra bits, there's extra overhead anytime you create a tunnel. So it's going to cause a little bit of extra overhead on the wired side, but the reality is for most of us, our wired network is not the problem. So that's probably not going to be a big issue. If you know that they only need internet access, then doing a tunnel into the DMZ will work perfectly fine for you from a performance perspective for most wired networks. Uh, but if you think that there might be need for a, a local printer or something like that, then you're probably going to look at a VLAN and then giving access to that local printer in that way. So that's usually going to be the differentiator which uh, you choose. Number one, does your vendor solution support tunneling in the first place? Uh, and number two, are they going to need access to local resources other than the internet? And keep in mind, those local resources can be things like uh, projectors that are on your network, uh, TVs, Apple TVs that are on your network, things like that. So it's not just printers anymore, so keep those other items in mind as well. Uh, should a guest access still support 11B rates? And hello from Queensland, Australia. Wow, <laughs> thank you for getting on so early. Very kind of you, Tony. Um, let me just say that uh, 11B rates for guest access is going to be up to you. Now, what I mean by that is obviously if you give that 11B 
access to the guest network, it's going to hurt not only your guest network, but also your enterprise network if you're doing um, uh, multiple SSIDs instead of separate physical hardware, right? So because you have multiple SSIDs all contending for that medium, um, even though it's the guest that is 11B, it still uses the airtime that's now not available for the other clients that would be using the same radio on the same channel. So it's very important to think about that when you're implementing and whether you're going to support those 11B data rates. My suggestion today would be no, don't support the 11B data rates anymore um, and see what kind of complaints you get. I don't think you'll get many today, but it's probably better to do that just for the performance of your network overall. And a lot of people are just saying, get rid of those 11B data rates and, and who cares if they complain because they should have a, a newer phone, a newer laptop, a newer tablet, you know, whatever it is that could support 11G or 11N. And if you really think about it, I mean, you know, you're talking about devices that would have come out probably pre-2006 anyway, in most cases, with the exception of some phones. And you know, those Wi-Fi phones probably aren't what you're going to use on your guest network anyway. So I would say in most cases, you're going to be very safe to disable 11B, okay? All right, well, if there are uh, no more questions, let me just say thank you for uh, attending with us today. And uh, remember that you have the forums at cwmp.com. So if you have further questions, you can ask there and the community is very good at supporting and getting you answers. So thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. And I look forward to seeing you later on this month. We'll have another webinar that is going to focus on actually uh, setting up some interesting things with some open source software. So uh, watch for that. If you haven't registered for it yet, we'll be looking at Zero Shell later on this month and see some of the things that we can do in relation to building Wi-Fi labs and things like that. So thank you for coming. Check out our conference, and I hope to see you on a webinar in the future.